the uh, Peruvians, the uh, shamans and the indigenous who live in the Andes, they talk about a prophecy, which is no longer a prophecy. It's called the Pachacuti. And the mm. Pachacuti happens every 500 years. And to break down the word Pacha, like Pachamama, can mean earth. <laughs> but in this context, Pacha means time. And Kuti means make it right. So Pachacuti, a time to make things right. And they have been talking about this time, which this Pachacuti is not a myth. We are in, in, in it, where the North and the South will come together, where the eagle and the condor will fly together again, where the rise of the divine feminine will occur. And so we have been in this place of so much masculine energy and the masculine energy. I'm getting goosebumps right now talking to you about this. So it's important. The masculine energy has impacted all of us. How many of us have time to ourselves? We're going, 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 so active, so overwhelmed, so busy, work too much, all of this. And how many of us are so deeply in touch with our hearts and giving love, which would heal the planet and humanity and giving compassion, right? These are all feminine qualities, yin and yang. And so, yes, the rise of the divine feminine, which is meant to be a part of a rise of the divine masculine. So like you said, heroes gamos, they can become one going forward. They can be a sacred union inside of us and outside of us in relationship. It is a huge part of the healing right now. Welcome to a Broaderlands podcast. The opinions expressed on Broaderlands podcast are those of the guest speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of the host or Broaderlands podcast. Debbie, thank you for coming on Broader Lens Podcast. It's really an honor. I really appreciate it. And I love all the work you do. Uh, I love learning from you. So thank you. Mm, you're so welcome. I really appreciate it. Thank you, universe, for connecting us. Yeah, thank you. And uh, maybe before we get started, you can share a little, about, a little bit about who you are and what you do. I have a real funny bone right now, so I'm trying to like re reel it in because I want to like <laughs> be, no problem. make jokes. But there's, you know what? That's really good because there's a big aspect of me that doesn't come out around that um, often, and it's one of the most joyous parts of me. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to start there because I literally just had a healing with a shaman, with a Celtic shaman, because today, and we'll go back and come here. I'm super passionate about shamanism and specifically, I mean, I love shamanism and the healing work I do for people around that. I love speaking on stage and being here with people like you and in interviews. And in conjunction for me, my other passion is extraterrestrial life forms and also yeah. different galaxies and where we're all from, us as star seeds. <clears throat> so I marry these together and I talk everywhere. But there's been some confusion for me because um, I wasn't mindfully heading here, first of all. And wow. second of all, yeah, it's been a huge surprise. And then what's opening up for me right now is also, it's very humbling and it's very beautiful. And I'm saying yes, because you look, when the universe gifts you and gives you very obvious breadcrumbs to your path, like, uh, you don't say no. It'll be bequeathed to somebody else, but I'm saying yes, and I'm honored. And so I had a healing, and the healing encompassed many things um, to help me even more uh, get more broad and expanded in this space. And he talked about some of my deep connections and how I can use them, and specifically with Mother Earth. And yeah. I do have a real relationship with her. So I spend time with her every day. And the um, the other thing he was saying, which is really coming up right now, because I just had this healing two nights ago. And he was like, you know, you have a lot of joy in you, a lot of innocence and a lot of joy. And stuff happened when I was young. And so some of that got ameliorated, right? It was confusing to be me and be in a really dark house. Yeah. Um, but I feel more of that, even more of that after working with this guy. So that's really great. And so not only do I offer the shamanic stuff, but hey, I still work with people, right? 
I, I am here to be of service. So I want to be the cleanest, best I can. And how I got here. Um, yeah, I was an actress and singer when I was a little girl. It's all I loved. I loved music so much. And I went into that. I um, moved out to California from New York and I became that professionally. And I did that for many, many years. It was very joyous until it wasn't. And when it wasn't, yeah. it was really weird because it's all I knew is my personality. It, my identity was about that. But I was so confused by it because this feeling that I was complete there wouldn't go away. And I knew nothing except to surrender and release it and say, okay, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do because this is all I've ever done. And I feel like all I'm ever good at. I surrendered and I followed energy and I didn't even do it mindfully. It's just what I did. And when I followed energy, things came and I said, well, I'm excited about that. I'll try it. Excited about that. So I did Toastmasters and I spoke professionally and I loved jewelry and I started making jewelry and selling it in stores and I started singing with a big band and a jazz band and like that. And then I did cartoon work, uh, voiceovers. And I got paid very well and I loved the voiceover work. And next, I, I wanted to get my voice out there more. I saw an ad 17 years ago for a radio station. They wanted somebody to do a show. Yeah. And I answered the ad and I got hired. And so I started first doing a music show and it was okay. It really wasn't my passion. And just was when I was thinking, you know, maybe I should leave after a couple of months. They came to me and said, we really like what you're doing. We want to give you your own show. Ta-da! Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger was born. And so for 17 years now, moving forward, I've been doing radio and podcast, same show, although the subject has changed a little bit as <laughs> I've grown. Um, it used to just be super spiritual and metaphysical, but then I got deeply into this extraterrestrial world and this cutting edge, you know, a little bit paranormal, uh, definitely channeling all of this. I was my wheelhouse. So that's why I started featuring. My audience came and grew. I'm on YouTube and all major channels. Um, and along the way, also, I wanted to reach more people. So I started writing books. I've got many international best-selling books out there. I've got more in me, but not right now. My life is so busy with beautiful opportunities. So in a year or two, I'll write another book. And I became a coach. You know, I became a coach for people who wanted to write books. I became a coach uh, for people who were like, how to get interviewed. And mm. I started uh, doing some publicity work for a small amount of people spiritual messengers. I get them booked on radio and podcasts. And then, yeah, you know, I become certified as a shaman and as a, as um, you know, in many different factions of shamanism. And I'm still, like I said, I work with people because I need also clearing and cleaning, but also because my hunger to keep working is there. And I'm just enrolled in a one-year program. Like it's not ending for me. So I'm loving my life right now. Like it's a pretty magical life. That's awesome. I, I, I could tell. I appreciate it. You're glowing, and I, I could tell you you love your life, and I, I really appreciate that because a lot of people don't. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people. I, I was in a place where I wanted to kill myself at one point, you know, and, the, mm -hmm. and then I had that awakening. But you know, I wanted to bring go back to something um, you said because I, I think this is an important question because it seems like um, when you talked <laughs> about marrying things together. Um, it seems like in the spiritual community, looking at ETs and the paranormal is kind of like shunned for many communities, but others intertwine it all. It all goes together. How does that all go together for you? Like, cause for me, naturally it's always, it all goes together, but other people think you're crazy if you're into ETs and the paranormal and, and so on. With great compassion, I was also that person. So full transparency, I was an eye roller. I was a very open-minded skeptic, but there were very particular things. I was like, whatever. Specifically, like if somebody told me about a past life regression, now mind you, super <laughs> spiritual since I'm a kid, super metaphysical. And yet somebody talked to me about a past life regression. I was like, really? Like you were where and who, I don't know. It just, 
And I think part of that is because uh, people, professionals had attempted with me previously and it just didn't work. I would flip up in my head right away and just like not be able to tell them what kind of sandals or shoes I had in my feet. I, that method did not work. So there I was a skeptic. And then when it came to extraterrestrial stuff, UFO stuff, I even had really good friends like, and they'd send me stuff. I rem yeah, I'm thinking about it right now. And like, they'd send me an email or a text and go, blah, 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 the Pleiades. I'm like, oh my God, what, <laughs> what, can we move on? Cause like, I'm not there with you, man. So I have compassion for anybody who doesn't believe it's super okay. Like believe what you want. If you don't believe it's okay. I had an awakening too, like you, and I was such a not believer. Um, then I had a past life regression, right? So we're, there's a lot of things that get married here that I was an eye roller about. Like I was an eye roller about uh, plant medicine, past life regression, and about uh, extraterrestrials. And so, you know, and then the universe laughed. <laughs> it said, oh, that's good. Let's show her. But they were so kind and gentle about it. All I know is for me, when something, when I become like online about something, when something comes to me and I have such strong discernment, I really trust it. And I suddenly realize, oh, that is truth. Zero resistance, but a hundred percent curiosity and desire to learn more. And that's how I flip. So for anyone out there who doesn't believe, God bless, right? Got it. I was there too. For anybody who's curious, that's probably why you're here right now in this conversation, mm -hmm. because that's a lot of what I do and believe. And I don't know um, about the marrying, because if I were to be honest, in my circles, everybody believes. And I think more and more people are waking up to all of this truth. I go out in the world and I'm, there's just something in me that can't. I'm very aware of my audience and who I'm speaking to because I, you know, you don't want to convince some. It's like politics. You don't want to go in there when somebody's completely on the opposite side. I just let that go. But I have found more and more I will go out and meet strangers and they'll even say, What's your podcast about? I'm like, It's about channeling. It's about extraterrestrials. It's about metaphysics, you know, and. And they're like, cool, I'm into that. You know, I saw spacecraft. I feel more and more people that I interact with, strangers, are totally in. And I'm like, this is so good. And then others, you know, it's okay. Wahaha. <laughs> You'll get there in way. You know, you brought up plant medicine. I know, I know I've heard you share on plant medicine and your experiences. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind touching on that. Because didn't that open the door for you? changed my life. You know, and I am very cautious when I say that because I never want someone to hear about this and feel like I should do that. Like there's a laundry list of things we need to do to become something. I believe strongly that with plant medicine, you're called or you're not. There's a lot of people out there who are psychic, who channel, and they will never do plant medicine. They're like, why would I already live in that world? Exactly. So I was invited to do plant medicine by a fellow podcaster many years ago, who's putting together a group. And I was like, why would I do that? That's drugs. I'm not going to do that. And then three months later, grandmother ayahuasca, because the plants come on, <laughs> they're alive. They have consciousness and wisdom reached out to me and said, we want you to come sit with us. And that again, bam, truth. I knew it. And because I feel so taken care of and loved and seen, there were a ton of synchronicities that began to happen that were extraordinary. And they were continuing to show me, yes, you need to do this. Yes, you need to do this. I have since drunk 25 times. I'm not really drinking these days because at this moment I feel complete. Two of the three times where plant medicine changed my life was last year. I was in a shaman course and I, grandmother ayahuasca said, sit with me while you're in the class. And I made the grand assumption, oh my gosh, she's going to give me all these special shaman secrets and I'm going to get all these downloads. 
I was completely off. She wanted me to sit because she was having me clean up my relationship with my mother. It was exhausting. The entire Friday night, I thought, ugh. However, I am so grateful for all of those hours and hours that she was cleaning, 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 cleaning. A week and a half after that ceremony, my mother's health changed dramatically and she passed. So grandmother mm -hmm. ayahuasca like so lovingly prepared me for my mother's passing. Huge, right? Wow. And then the other time was the many years previous. It was my second time drinking. I was going out of country. I had extraordinary things happen, four back-to-back -back nights of drinking the medicine, and I saw sacred geometry. I did see past lives. Ah. It was massive. Traumas were healed. The big one was that starting the first night, the, um, the divine, the energy of the divine came to me and said, Debbie, you're a healer, you're a shaman, you're a priestess. Mm. And I had no context for any of those words. And I argued and I said, I'm sorry, I'm not those things. First of all, look what it takes to become a shaman. I mean, <laughs> I'm just here drinking. I, I don't. Mm. And second of all, healer. No, those are my friends. I do have extraordinarily gifted friends or people come in my show and priestess. Cool. I'll take it. But still no context. So every night she worked with me, she came back and said the same thing like a mantra. And she showed me another piece and showed me another piece. By the final night, she said, I want you to go up to the shaman and tell him you want a shaman's blessing. 20 minutes of arguing. She wouldn't back down. And I did. I went up and he gave me a shaman's blessing. She then said, go to this other shaman who was a, a, a fem female, Sarah, and ask her for a blessing to understand your shaman's journey. And she said, and you cannot call her by name. You have to call her sister. Really <laughs> humbling. So I did, and she gave me this beautiful blessing in Spanish. Okay, I come home. I'm super confused. And... My friend, one of my gifted healer friends said, let me give you some past life regressions. He did a method like nobody else I'd ever experienced. So he put me under. And I saw myself as a Native American man. I was absolutely a shaman. It was a beautiful life. So at peace with nature and animals and everything. Uh, the second time he put me under, I saw myself as a seven foot tall priestess who was wow. Mayan. And she lived in a temple and led the people. And I really enjoyed my time with her. I was kind of blown away by her. And before I left, I asked her a question about her abilities. And I was making an assumption and she shook her head and she raised her finger and telepathically said to me, I am not from here. I'm from another galaxy. Mm -hmm. So I come out and I'm like, woof. Okay. First of all, I'm Mayan awesome. And a priestess, okay, click, click, this is starting to connect past lives or concurrent lives. Second of all, she's Mayan, lives in a temple, beautiful. Third of all, she's seven feet tall and she's from another galaxy. So I am, have been aspect of not from here. And that's when all of that opened up for me. And it became this huge deep dive of speaking to people who channeled extraterrestrials of gathering information, of exploring my galactic lineage. I mean, years of it. And what an incredible journey, because I got to tell you, the more I learn, the more I want to learn and the more that's out there. This is like a gift that keeps on giving. It's so fascinating. And I'll just end it by saying I tend to stay on the literally light side and not the dark. There's a lot of dark theories out there. And I'm not saying that malevolent energies don't exist, but I do think it's interesting. You know, we learn in metaphysics that we are what we think and believe. And I very much have only experienced benevolence and love. And so I'm going to continue to do that because it's only created great experiences for me in my field. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for saying that because I've heard about that too by a number of people about the dark side and inviting all these negative entities and stuff. So, yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, 
you talked about trauma. Um, does can these plant medicines help people heal from trauma? Hundred percent. You know what they do is they encircle the trauma and they expel it from the body. That's the short version. Trauma gets stuck in the body and is surrounded by water. We are so much water, right? And the beautiful thing about plant medicine is its wisdom. Now, in the beginning of any circle, you sit and you'll always sit around and ha have an intention. You'll share your intention. I'll share mine and the other people there will share theirs. I always think it's hilarious because I don't know if anyone ever gets their intention. I never do because the plant's like, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> I know what you need anyway, and you're going to get what you actually need, not what you want. And so that's cool. Um, and so regarding the trauma specifically, you drink the medicine and it doesn't happen all the time, by the way. I don't throw up every time I drink it by any means or otherwise. Um, but, and I think especially at the beginning, that's when people do because you're new and you're cleaning. It's beautiful because it's like uh, 90 years of therapy getting handled like that. So the plant has wisdom. It comes into you. Should there be a trauma that instead of having to go through all these healers and therapy, you can expel like that, it will surround the water holding the trauma and take it out this end or the other. There are people out there who say, oh, I don't want to drink medicine because I don't want to throw up. And I get it because the context is when I was drunk and I threw up or when I had food poisoning, and I threw up, which is a or, or I had a flu. It's a horrible, horrible feeling, right? That kind of vomiting is terrible. But when you're going to throw up on plant medicine, if you do, and not everybody does, um, but if you do, it's a different feeling. You can literally feel something nasty that you have been holding on to without even realizing is coming out of you. And there are people who even say that as it goes in the bucket, they are aware oh my God, that was my blah, 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 boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, society, gender, whatever the hell you went through coming out. And the relief is massive. Wow, thank you. Steve, did you get the runs at all? No, but I mean, there are stories out there. Like we even once had a, um, a what do you call it? A, a shaman who was leading a ceremony. To, and they started talking about it. And he said, um, you know, don't laugh. Because, I mean, he's drunk a thousand <laughs> times. And he said, one time I did, I shit in my pants. And so, <laughs> so because I heard that story, boo -boo, it was so like, you think about these things, right? Every time I went to a ceremony, I was always bringing an extra pair of pants, five pair of underwear. I'm like, I just didn't want to be that person. But thank God it never happened. <laughs> you call diapers? <laughs> Depends. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> some for everybody. <laughs> um, and what about past life trauma? Do you believe we can have past life trauma? Absolutely, I do. I absolutely do. So it's interesting because, and I can only um, reference this from healings I've had when people have worked on me and said, oh, okay, you've carried this around in a couple of lifetimes and you've had, you know, X, Y, Z trauma that keeps it still happening. Or it happened then, it's not happening now, but you're still responding as though it is. And so I've had that stuff, even without knowing or understanding it, just clean, clean, clean out of me, um, definitely. And of course, I 100% know that there's ancestral trauma for mm. probably all of us, you know, whose lineage hasn't experienced war and famine and rape and pillaging and, you know, whatever else. So that stuff is also so important to clean up. Our, um... Diego de Landa, he was the first bishop of um, um, like Chichen Itza area, but he had a diary and he he um I got I got a copy of it in my bookshelf, but uh, and he wrote all the experiences when they first came into uh, the Yucatan P Peninsula and um, like you would you would probably be murdered if he got there before the Spaniards came because 
uh, you're a, a, a pretty female. So what he was doing, he was killing the females. And he, he wrote it down. Yeah, I burned these two females. One was a virgin. One was married. And um, and it was like nothing. We, we murdered them before the rest of the Spaniards came. But that can, you could still, that still can affect people now. All that. I mean, he talked about, it shows people being burned. He drew the pictures and everything, um, which was crazy. Um, does that still affect us to this day? Do you believe that is so profound what you're saying? And it's really making me think about uh, feminine, feminine collective trauma, which is not something I've ever considered before. But as I'm listening to you, it's evident that it's real because, you know, in our history, like I'm talking about real history, yeah. uh, originally the females, women were the leaders. And uh, yeah. males were the co-creators, right? Uh, they weren't slaves or anything like that, but they were also co-creators. But the female were the goddesses, the priestesses, the leaders. And then, you know, something started to turn, right, in history, where it became a very male-dominated and still is today societies and cultures and planet. And what's very interesting about what you say, I am considering, you know, how many times it is said that women allowed this to happen. This couldn't have happened. Men couldn't have done this if women didn't agree. And I'm suddenly realizing as you say this, that it makes sense that women would agree because when things like that happen in history, and my God, how many things happen with women being called witches and being burned and being like even today, women are stoned to death for showing their face or uh, that they went out in the daytime or went to school, read a book. I mean, crazy stuff on this planet. So the rise of the divine feminine right now is a big part of the healing that's going to happen for all of us, all of us, because men and women, we have both in us. So yeah. this is going to bring us into a place of great balance. And I think some of this will be superseding this collective female women trauma that they've endured over history. And uh, what an important point. Yeah, thank you. Which in the Gospel of Thomas, there's a verse where Yeshua is saying when the two become one, mm -hmm. you know, the male and the, the masculine and female energy. Um, not in balanced, and I think it's in balanced right now. And you hear a lot of men trying to stand up for the masculine energy and all that stuff, but it's not. We're not saying that we're going to take away the masculine. We just got to balance it out within ourselves. And exactly. I think that's enlightenment, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, so true. Right now, the uh, Peruvians, the shamans, and the indigenous who live in the Andes. They talk about a prophecy, which is no longer a prophecy. It's called the Pachacuti. And the mm. Pachacuti happens every 500 years. And to break down the word Pacha, like Pachamama, can mean earth. <laughs> but in this context, Pacha means time. And Kuti means make it right. So Pachacuti, a time to make things right. And they have been talking about this time, which this Pachacuti is not a myth. We are in, in, in it where the north and the south will come together, where the eagle and the condor will fly together again, where the rise of the divine feminine will occur. And so we have been in this place of so much masculine energy and the masculine energy. I'm getting goosebumps right now talking to you about this. So it's important. The masculine energy has impacted all of us. How many of us have time to ourselves. We're going, going, going. So active, so overwhelmed, so busy, work too much. All of this, and how many of us are so deeply in touch with our hearts and giving love, which would heal the planet and humanity, and giving compassion, right? These are all feminine qualities, yin and yang. And so, yes, the rise of the divine feminine, which is meant to be a part of a rise of the divine masculine. So like you said, heroes gamos, they can become one going forward. They can be a sacred union inside of us and outside of us in relationship. It is a huge part of the healing right now. And also about having reverence for the planet that feeds us and clothes us and nurtures us to have respect for her 
I appreciate that. Thank you. You, um, you talked about ancestral trauma. Um, anybody that may not have even heard of the term, maybe you can um, help broaden our lens on that a little bit more, if you don't mind. Yeah, what is ancestral trauma? We could take you and I right now and be great examples. So let's start with you. What, can you say what your ethnicity is? My, um, <laughs> um, obviously Mexican, right? Um, but also, yeah, a native, native, uh, heritage as well. And I have a little bit of Irish in me. Beautiful. Like right there. So you say, what have the Mexicans been through in history that you could say was traumatic to the people? Like just give one or two examples. Well, it's pretty much, uh, there are, people don't really realize this. I might upset some people, but if you really think about it, Mexican people were natives and Spaniards and the Spaniards came and raped the natives. So they're a product of rape. I hate to say it like that, but that's kind of the truth. That's how you created Mexicans, because they didn't do it all that by by will. These Spaniards were forcing themselves, forcing Jesus, forcing their religions, forcing their, their beliefs, and then forcing sex with the women and created Latinos, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, they did a lot to a lot of different cultures, including mine, <laughs> and to the Peruvians as well. Um Okay. And in your family, if you don't mind me getting a little personal, is there anything, is there um, some kind of trauma or is there like a lot of cheating or is there um, like alcoholism or anything like that? Yeah, there's a lot of gang and uh, addiction in my family. Alcoholism for sure. I was an alcoholic at one time. Wow. Awesome. Keep coming back. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) that's beautiful so you are a perfect example and by the way we could flip anybody in your seat and i could do this and this is just this much but you know you go back your grandparents your great grandparents your great great grandparents and both sides now you have both sides of a family tree and you're looking at what countries did they live in what kind of wars did they go through what were they up against What did they even do inside of the family that may have messed people up and created dysfunction? And then you and I are living at a time, boo-boo, where it's like there is healing. There is open conversation. Our parents and everyone else up the line, no. They just lived with it and stuffed it. Some crazy stuff that they had to endure. And so that is ancestral lineage. And it gets passed down literally in our DNA and unknowingly we're responding to things. They're not even happening here, but it happens somewhere back there, but it's still in us. I have a friend who um, does epigenetics. She's amazing. Mm. And that's all she does. She works with people. It doesn't matter if they come to her for financial stuff relationship stuff, their health, whatever the issue, she will immediately look at the epigenetics, meaning their ancestral line and clean stuff up. That's amazing. And I'll use myself last here as an example. When I said I was an actress, when I was younger and I was, and when I was in my twenties, uh, I remember doing a play and having a conversation with another cast member. He was an o- older than me person. And and very wise guy. And he was asking me about myself. So I shared and he said, oh my gosh, your father was in the Holocaust. So I was raised Jewish. Your father was in the Holocaust. He's like, wow, you're a second generation. And I said to him, what does that mean? I never heard that term. He said, that means that what happened to your father lives in you. And you might want to think about getting involved with some kind of second generation therapy group, or at least going to learn more about it. And so I went online after that, like, what the heck is that? And reading so much about how I didn't live in Austria. I didn't live in Belgium. I didn't have family that went to a concentration camp, but my father did. And my father was a hidden child in a church and he had to change identities and all of this. My father freaking has trauma, big trauma. And so unknowingly, that's living in me, and I'm responding out here in ways I'm not realizing that it's so interesting how deep this gets. So I'm not realizing, for an example, 
that anytime I'm betrayed or I have to even move homes, this is real. I would go through so much. Most people, maybe they don't like change and they just move homes. But me, it was freaking so traumatic for me to let go of where I was and considering moving. But when you think about the lineage just of Jewish people, where they started and every place they were, they got accepted into a place, another country. They, they were actually very loved at first and a huge contribution to the city and the town. And then that city and town would turn on them and say, you're devils, you're bad people, you know, and, and do horrible things to them. And they had to flee those who could leave and move to another country. It would happen over again and over again and over again. So there's that. And it's kind of interesting. I'm going to go a little galactic here. So one of the things I was looking at, because, of course, my galactic ancestry, another ancestry to look at. Um, I were, have been many things, but there's been a few uh, star beings I have been in particular. One of them is Liren, the lion people. And I realized this like just a few weeks ago and I went, oh my God, the Liren people, innocent, joyful. They lived in paradise. The Draconians come along. They believe them that they want to be friends. And instead the Draconians go after them to destroy them and their planet. And what do they have to do? The few that still remain, they, they're refugees. They have to get on spacecraft and go to Sirius or Pleiades or Orion. They got to start all over again. And so I realize this is so deep in me. It's not just this lifetime. I've been here before and it wasn't just my father. Now it's me we're talking about. This is trauma that needs to be cleared up because I don't need to be in this lifetime replicating betrayal. I don't need to be in this life, lifetime re-experiencing, constantly having to leave my home and being re-traumatized. So that's why we do this kind of work. You do, I do. So all that stuff that's not even ours gets mm. cleaned up. And guess what? While we're doing that heavy lifting, that work, that cleaning and healing, our ancestors are doing the happy dance, the touchdown dance, because they're like, this is part of why you were born. Thank you so much, because everything that goes forward from you, it's going to be very different than what we left behind, and they really appreciate it. Well, thank you. You know, uh, once you start to learn about epigenetics, even the basics, it's hard to start to continue to speak victimese. You know, and... and um. Going full circle back to what we've been discussing, Gabor Mate, if people think we're crazy about talking about plant medicine, he's found a lot of good results with trauma in ayahuasca. Um, and he comes from, he was born in Hungary, right? And he was a baby when this was all going on with the Holocaust. And he explains it perfectly in his life story about how he experienced a lot of trauma and inherited that trauma from his upbringing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. and. You know, there's so many people, there are more people who do plant medicine than you might realize. People that we look up to, celebrities, athletes, uh, musicians. I mean, one place, because we, we don't give this information out and there's a reason, you know, they just, they just should be protected sacred places. So I'm not going to talk about the name of this place, but this place where I went years ago, where I had a lot of the profound experience with the divine talking, I, you know, I'm on their list, I'm on their Instagram, I'm on their Facebook, and I'm constantly seeing the owner with huge <laughs> name people, everything, things, people, men, women, you may not expect. But again, only if you're called to it, and you know the truth, like you get that feeling. It's okay. And it's okay if you're scared, because I was like super scared in the beginning. But yeah. I wonder what uh, Gabor Mate would say when you bring up galactic trauma. <laughs> I don't know make... that that's his thing. I mean, he's got yeah, his own brilliance, <laughs> but there's so many of us who like really get it, you know, really get like, do you know your lineage, by the way, galactically? No, I don't. Um, I don't, to be honest. We should remedy that. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, you know, you brought up, uh, um, you were asking me earlier, like my, my, my background in the Tongva tribe, I don't know if you're familiar with the Tongva tribe, yes. but yeah, I'm connected to the, um, them. Even Richie Gowans was. 
I don't know if you remember Richie Valens, the old singer, but yeah, um, he's actually a, a cousin of mine, a distant cousin of mine. But That's cool. yeah, the, the Tongva tribe. We're still trying to remember, you know, our ancestry. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah. But, yeah. Getting wiped out, just forgetting your whole your know, history and yeah. And that's why being a storyteller is so important because to pass the stories on, to find some way to pass the stories on, to tell your story to your kids or your nieces and nephews or, or on stage, you know, to anybody who will listen so that there's some kind of um, breadcrumb back to your people. Yeah, because we're forgetting um, faster and faster, it seems like. Because, uh, you know, unfortunately, the Abrahamic religions, uh, well, you know, Christianity, for an example, they came and conquered all the lands, and everyone's starting to forget their 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 history, their past, their traditions, their culture, because it's all now the Abrahamic religion, um, you know, Amer Americanized, Westernized, and people are forgetting. I was talking to my buddy from Samoa, and doesn't know anything about his past history. So it's pretty interesting. Do you think it's important to remember? Good question. I will tell you, I don't know about important, but I think it's helpful. And the reason mm. why I think it's helpful is when someone has shared with me, things have clicked and I've been like, oh, that's why I do that for a living. Oh, that's why I function like that. That's why there are so many proclivities that I have that learning lineage has really helped with. So I think there's a lot of tools out there, to be honest. Like, I think human design is amazing. I've had that done. And that answered tons of questions, you know, sometimes astrology, numerology. Like, I'm into all of that because all of those hold pieces and keys. And I think also galactic or just human lineage, learning those, it you just start to understand more about exactly why you are who you are. I just did, if anybody's interested, I just did a two-hour deep dive with a massive expert on star seeds. And you can go to my channel, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Just spell my name right. D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R. And I, because... I'm doing a lot of research on that, and uh, I actually want to gift people. I'm going to make a landing page so I can gift people with a free report that breaks down all the different star seeds so they can start to see themselves, oh, I'm that, or I already know I'm that, and now that makes so much sense. Like, they'll see what kind of jobs they usually have, the kind of personality they have, sometimes their weaknesses. And so along with this beautiful report I put together, I wanted to do a, like a informational back and forth with an expert. <clears throat> she was amazing. And so for a little over two hours, we are getting such amazing feedback on this. People are thanking us because of the recognition and the freedom they're feeling, understanding all this. And so anyway, that's available to anybody who would like to find out a little more about their galactic lineage. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Thank you. I'll look into that myself. Um, you, you, um, you talked about you were able to see past lives. I remember when I was a kid, I, I um, when I seen Star Wars, I knew something was very familiar in, in here. Mm. And then when I seen Indiana Jones or those old Chinese kung fu movies on the regular TV back in the on the weekends um, in the eighties, I remember like seeing the the environment and that looked very familiar to me. Like I had this remembrance in here though. It wasn't even right here. It was in here, and um. Yeah, it's just interesting. Um, past lives. Uh, what did your past lives look like? If you don't mind me asking. At all. And I, I just want to riff off of what you were just saying, where you were watching something and you had that feeling. So I love anything that has to do with Vikings. I'm, mm. I don't know. I find it fascinating. <laughs> like just fascinating people, period. Yes, they were conquerors. Yes, they could be brutal. But let's face it, they had the deepest spirituality. They did use plant medicine, their, their own variety. And they also were able to access different realms for healing and for prophecy and seeing. They were powerful people, beautiful people, really lived on the land. And so 
when I had my DNA tested, as most people do, I thought it was really boring. I'm like 96% European, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, God, that's not cool at all. I need something like way more spicy. And so then I heard something where you could get your genomes tested. And essentially that means that they take the raw data of your DNA and they put it through their system. And then they come, they, the, Sorry, they analyze the chromosomes, and the chromosomes are like the ones that go do 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 deep into the core of who you actually are. That was where the juice was, and so it turned out that inside of me is Scandinavian Viking. So I'm saying that because I really believe that when you see something and you have that feeling, you have that feeling because you are remembering something. There is a connection there that's deep. I believe in it strongly. And the other thing I told you two past lives earlier that I saw myself as a Native American man, uh, dark skin, dark haired, strong, small. And then I saw myself as a seven foot tall, uh, otherworldly Mayan priestess. And so when I had my DNA tested, I thought, I really want to know, do I have any kind of native anything? So you, you give them a broad category and they test very deeply. And it could have come up nothing, which it did in some categories, or it could have come up, you know, in any of like 50 different under native. How did it come up? 99.6% Mayan. Can't write this stuff. Yeah. And 0.4% Native American. And I was like, that is so cool. My <laughs> past life was like, it's still in me, right? And then the other times I've experienced it was um, one time when I was on plant medicine and I, this place had beautiful they had a lot of beautiful things like Buddhas and, you know, it was quite a, a just gorgeous landscape. But the one thing they had was um, this head from Easter Island. Now, I've never been to Easter Island. I have zero resonance with it. It's like, but I recognize it. But it was constant calling to me and it was telling me it was his, my, it was my husband. And I was like, like when I was on medicine, this made sense. There was no resistance. When I came out, I'm like, what? And I talked to somebody who's very well known in transformation. And I was so fortunate because she immediately said to me, sweetie, this was a past life. And this was true information. And I was like, it really felt like it by the, by the final, you know, night. It was like, we're just really, there was so much love and I was just, there was a gorgeous bench next to it. And I literally just sat under this tremendous statue and spent time with it as though it had life to it. Um, yeah, it's profound. It's really profound. And anyone who's drunk understands. And if you don't, please suspend belief for a minute to know that these experiences are so massively real. They're not imagination by any means. But um and then other past lives, yeah, I don't, I'm not thinking of right now. I haven't done a ton of that. Not a ton of it. The embarked on my lady, I, I could picture a flat butt. Is that true? I'm just playing out Smithson Road. I just oh, said she that. actually was really <laughs> slender. <laughs> Have you ever heard the term in la kish? No, I just not It's very similar to namaste. It means mm. you are I and I am you. Mm. Which I think that's a beautiful saying, uh, um, a principle they lived by for a long time before all that other sacrifice stuff. It was mm. actually way before that. But they lived by that in La Kish, and they treated everything in La Kish that we were all one. It was acknowledging the oneness, and I think it's beautiful. And you say it in La Kish? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really nice. Namaste in La Kish. Yeah, I yeah. like that. Or like Aloha, you know? Mm. Um, acknowledging for so. shalom yeah the very peaceful ways of acknowledging really someone's soul yeah, and yeah, it is. yeah thank you um what's your take on the anunnaki i wanted to ask you that before i forget <laughs> well they help shape who we are we wouldn't be us 
I heard Bashar say this, so I, I can't claim I know this, but I heard if I, I always assume people know who Bashar is. Mm-hmm. He's channeled. He's a Sasani being who comes from the planet as Sasani, and he is channeled by Daralanka. And Bashar was saying that we would have been Bigfoot. We would have been the Sasquatch. Was it were it not that our DNA was modified and rearranged? So I thought that's interesting. Um, okay, he says so many interesting things. I can make it a whole tangent. The other piece of it is that 450,000 years ago, the Anunnaki were having problems on their planet, namely they were losing their atmosphere because they had done kind of like what we're doing right now, destroying our resources. So they would, had to, were destroying, almost destroyed their atmosphere, and they had to find another place to live. And they wanted to find a solution for their planet. The solution for their planet was gold. Monatomic gold can be blown into the atmosphere to help heal it. And so on Earth, in Africa, there was gold 450,000 years ago. So they wanted to come here and mine. Mining is a lot of work. And so the Anunnaki were extremely tall, were considered godlike because they were new to whatever form, shape, if it was Sasquatch or others, that the earth beings at that time were in. And the earth beings at that time lived very long, highly intelligent. And the Anunnaki wanted to create a race that would do the labor for them. So they didn't themselves have to mine for gold. So they decided to take what we had at that time, which was a 12-strand DNA, and modify it to a two strand so we would be willing to do the work for them, which they did. However, two things happened. The first is that human beings, it was very detrimental. They weren't able to live long anymore. They started dying earlier. Women started dying in uh, childbirth, and then a lot of health issues came about. Now, that's on this plane, what a mess for humanity. Now, on the galactic plane, they were being recalled because they were never supposed to do that. Like, mm. And so, because there are good Anunnaki's, right? And they say, what are you doing, you rogue crazies? Come back to the planet. You were never supposed to do that because Earth is what? It's a planet of our own choice, free will. You can't take someone's will away. It's a no-no. It's wrong protocol. They were recalled. And in the meantime, here we were suffering. And thank God these benevolent races wanted to seed us and to help us to start getting healthy and live long and be able to procreate and all of that. So we were seeded then by five races. And that's why we're all really related because we've got the feline race. We've got the avian race in us. We've got the reptilian race in us. We've got the Lyran beings and the high light beings inside of us. So we are a DNA soup of so many things. And that's that about the Anunnaki. I mm. mean, interesting folk. Do you think there's a connection with the Elohim to, some connect to the Anunnaki? No, I really don't. Oh, no, I've never heard try to say that. I know uh, Paul Wallace kind of connects them. Hmm. I mean, it's funny because the inception of my soul actually is Elohim, as oh. I've been told. And, you know, these are the co-creators. They are on the same par as God. And I can't, yeah, I can't even imagine them because I just, and by the way, it's such an interesting question because I asked this woman, I told you about this two hour star seed deep dive that's Mm. on the YouTube channel. I asked her one of the first questions is, are the Elohim considered star seeds? And she said, absolutely not. They have nothing to do with star seeds at all. They are their own race. They were the planet creators, the galaxy creators, the creators, right? They are very godlike, not in an ego way, but in a massive manifestation way. So they, um, I don't think they have anything to do with Anunnaki. It's interesting. And God knows there's a lot of theories out there about a lot of things. But like, I just stick to what feels like truth. And like, the more I go down these interesting paths of information keeps adding up 
Yeah, I do the same thing. So, yeah, I appreciate that. Follow our own intuition, right? Yeah, our, our own, knowing. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Do you think we're going to have a um, contact eventually? Because, you know, you're going to have people are probably skeptics listening to us right now. Do you think there's eventually going to be some kind of, a, you know, major contact? Yeah, I explosion? do. Definitely. That is exactly where we're headed. They've been waiting for us for a long time, but what a mess we are, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, what a mess we are. Just the wars alone and the fact that people are still starving on the planet and those terrible things that are done to children. Yeah. Ugh. But that's the bad news. The good news is, yes, there's a 90% chance, so says Bashar, that in... Uh, the end of 2026, so it's coming up, end of 2026, beginning of 2027, there will be something unprecedented. So I call it undeniable first open contact, because obviously throughout all of history, we've been having contact with extraterrestrials and with UFOs. I've had contact. I have seen many spacecraft. I have had extraterrestrials come to me. And, and so far, it's funny, um, some people receive them energetically. Some people actually go into a spacecraft. I have not had, well, to the best of my knowledge, I have not had either. But I have been visited in my dream. And it is so different than a dream. It's nothing like it. And for me, it's been ah, beautiful like very wonderful experience. And so, yes, 2026, 2027, unprecedented first incident, we will call it, very positive. So it has been said that they're still waiting for us energetically to get it together. We do not have to be perfect. We need to get it together a little bit. And for those of us who want to be on this timeline, who are interested in this, right, I know I want to be here when it happens. So I'm hoping the timeline goes quicker. <laughs> then we will be on that timeline. And they are very purposeful, mindful about how they're going to connect with us. They're not going to suddenly send, I'm trying to think of something like a fish race or, or you know, a mantis beings, because most human beings would be freaking terrified right? So they're highly aware that they want to connect with us first by those who look like us. So yeah. specifically, that means it could be the Pleiadians first. We are genetic cousins. They look like us. Uh, they look humanoid, uh, although they're a far, far advanced race. The next potentially would be the Yael. The Yael are a hybrid race. They were literally created by extraterrestrial and human DNA put together. So they love us. And they look at us fondly because we are their cousins, their brothers, their sisters, their parents sometimes. So very possibly it could be the Yael. And then after that, probably the Sasani. And once we realize they are not going to cook us and eat us like we would do to each other. <laughs> that, you know, they're advanced races. They have no interest in all that. Trust me, they could have done damage a long time ago, but it will be benevolent. It will be wonderful. It will be a great opportunity for relationship and technology exchanges and all of that. And once we have become settled in these way, these first waves, as the waves keep going, then they are going to start looking a lot less like us. And at that time, it should be that humanity is like, good good to go. Like, I get this. This is working out. And, and I just want to add this because there's like to pay homage to the people who really believe like, oh, there's dark energies and, and all the terrible things they're going to do. And again, I'm not saying that malevolence doesn't exist, but I also have been told, and I believe it strongly that we are protected, you know, that there are craft who watch over beings. It is their purpose, their mission to watch after earth and humanity and they don't let that stuff infiltrate the world so even though our movies depict this horror and our tv shows i was i was recently a contact in the desert a big ufo event and i was watching this panel and they were saying from then there was these are big people and all the industries including the film industry and they were saying do you know in all of history there's only been four movies ever made that were positive about extraterrestrials. And they were naming them, you know? And so 
most of them are terrifying for people to watch. Um, and maybe that's good for the government because it keeps us afraid and dependent on them and not wanting this to happen. But the real truth is that the extraterrestrials I've come to know, I mean, I'm in, I love them. I have a real relationship with them. And I know they are really looking forward to the day when they can connect with us, all of us. And they're also not going to rush it until we are ready. Thank you. I appreciate what you just said because I have Nancy Timms coming on. Uh, are you familiar with her? Um, she's coming on tomorrow. Oh, yeah. And, uh, she's, she's, yeah. So uh, she talks about having all these great experiences, expanding her consciousness, enlightening experiences with these ETs since she was like two years old. So I look forward to talking to her and learning from her tomorrow. So. Yeah. Yeah. I know she's just getting out there in a big way all of a sudden. Oof, it's good. <laughs> it's good. See, that's why I mean people are waking up because more and more shows like yours and mine, more and more people like me and Nancy, more. It's just so yummy right now. The government is starting to admit, okay, truth. There have been spacecraft. There have been extraterrestrials. Okay. We've always known it. Yes, we worked on this and this. Yes, the stuff you saw, the footage from the Navy really exists. Yes, there were Tic Tacs. Yes, there, you know, and then there were whistleblowers. And I have been told by somebody very in the know that the whistleblowers are not going to stop. They are now, especially the more the government goes after people who worked in government who are speaking up, they're now banding together, these whistleblowers, and going, uh -uh, not on my watch. I'm going to tell the truth. You know, do what you need to do. Try to come after me and destroy my reputation, my family, and all that. But I'm going to band together with these other people and start telling the truth about what's been going on because it's deep. It's really mm. deep truth. You know, I'm going to send you a picture later of a craft I seen recently by my house right around the corner, and I see them a lot actually. But which is weird because, and I've talked about this before, it was shaped, it was camouflaged like in the clouds. It, it actually had like this cloud texture on the on the UFO. And what it was a huge, like a football field or two long, wide, right? What what really struck me odd was that I, it seemed like I was the only one that stopped and took a picture of it. Like, why didn't anyone else see this thing? <laughs> yeah, um, boo boo, it was for you. I had that's so funny, and I've been there. I was on a freeway once in a truck with four people. We actually were doing CE5 work, uh, mm. Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind out in Joshua Tree. Nothing happened, but we had a great night, and it was late. And we were going home on the freeway in California, and all of a sudden, bam, right in front of the truck, spacecraft. And I'm like freaking out and tell, asking the driver, do you see this? Do you see this? And then the gals in the back seat woke up, and they're like, everybody's a buzz. It took us a while to pull over um, on the freeway so we could take video and pictures. And, you know, nobody else, nobody else stopped and saw. And I have been told, and I'm telling you now, it's because that was for you. You are, And, of course, you're not going to see anything unless you're in resonance with it somewhere. So clearly you are. You might ask a question next time you see it. Seriously. Because there is no distance for them. They're so advanced. And you might say, like, who are you? Why me? What are you doing here? Is there anything you can tell me about yourself? Like, do we have a connection? Right? Mm. Be interesting. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind. I'll definitely do that next time. So I appreciate it. That's the second time. So. And then send me that email. <laughs> yeah. Um, before we go, um, I'd love to ask you what's your conception on what we call, some people call source or others call it God. Good question. It's such a deep question, you know. I mean, I could give the party line, which yeah, is like right? everything. And it's the God and it's the goddess. And it's like, but the more, the best I can explain it is the more I become spiritual, honestly, the less I understand. I do get that it is this massive energy, if you will, that created all of us and all of this, but gave us so much free will that we can create. I love how you said victimese. I've never heard that before. <laughs> so I'm going to coin your phrase and say <laughs> we could create victor over our lives, victory or victimese. We could create rich, we can create poor. Sometimes our soul needs to experience these things too. So it's mm -hmm. not a blame game. 
it's just, you know, this thing with source. And when we die, we go back to source and reintegrate. Um, and the fact that, you know, the galaxies and universes are so vast and the types of beings are vast. And even on this planet, how many animals and types of people, it's like, wow, man, <laughs> what an imagination, what a creation. So there is that aspect, which is almost like so incredible to conceive. And, and then of course I have questions for God, right? I always like yeah. asking people that question. Like, so what would you ask God when you reintegrate, when you pass from this life? And, um, and, and then there's the part that is like just love, that is just pure love and that I can feel and I can let in that just exactly how I am, who I am, whatever I am, I'm just loved. And that is it's just grace, you know, to experience that. So that encapsulates what God, goddess is for me. That's a profound answer. I appreciate it. Thank you. I think I'm going to ask Neil Donald Walsh that when he comes on soon. So <laughs> see what he has to say. But I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. And um, do you have any links you would like to share with us? Any projects or your websites you'd like to Thank share? Thank you. I would love to. Yes, there's so much going on if you want to connect with me further. First of all, I am starting a shaman healing class. And it's going to be uh, once a week. And the beautiful thing is I'm not teaching shamanism. I am gifting shamanism, as in you come from anywhere in the world on Zoom, and we're going to do a one-hour live healing together. As a group, I will be leading it, obviously. Um, I could tell you these practices have changed my life, doing these trades with other people. And so it's gorgeous. Um, and I'm excited to share that. So go to my webpage, debbiedashinger.com, and there is a button there that says Shaman Program. The other thing is, I am speaking this year in Glastonbury, UK, in September, Portal to Ascensions. Mm. So you can join me, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited. That's a sacred site in the world. I'm also speaking aboard a Galactic Origins Cruise in December to the Yucatan. Right. Mm, I've never wow. been there before. Super excited about that. We're also going to sacred places and they have a, a lot of presenters and it's all included in the price of the cruise. Uh, the speakers are unreal, very, very high end people know you'll know. So if you want to join me, it's also on my website on debbie-dashinger.com. And you could just click on that button for the cruise. Uh, you could do everything. And finally, if you want to follow my podcast, it is Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. And you can go to easiest is it's also on my website, frankly. Um, that's easy. Uh, you could also go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Thank you. And I got a good connection down there if you want to learn how to make Maya tamales. <laughs> mm. Mm. They're really good. Well, they're land excursions. I don't know how much time we mm. have. Yeah. But um it might be worth it to find out because, man, I love to do that. Yeah. Are they corn tamales or what yeah, do they, they mean? Yeah, they are. Mm. They are corn. I have some There's, video of me cooking. <laughs> it, it's like when I've been to Mexico. Like, I live in California, so it's a lot of Mexican food here. Yeah. But when I've been to Mexico, Mexico, like real indigenous Mexico, and you have the food that somebody has made from scratch, including... Like you say, the tamales or the tortillas is uh, like yeah. the beans, different animal, completely different world to taste that kind of food. So, yeah, that would be right up my alley. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to end this with a Michael Horner a quote. He says, what's really important about shamanism is that there is another reality that you can personally discover. We are not alone. And thank you for touching on that today. Ah, oh, thank you for ending with that today. That's beautiful. Well, in la Kesh, thanks for coming on. In la Kesh, namaste. Hmm. Nam namaste. There's no way out here. No way out here working in a major way. Had to speak all me just to make a play. Any given subject, no we make a way. Time to level up on the day to day. No way out here working for the greater good. Expand your mind, brighten your lens the way you should. From the stars to the galaxy, the skin on spirituality. I understand for the neighborhood. Thank you.